Welcome, everybody. For those of you just joining us for this afternoon's talks, welcome to the NASA Gregory G. Leptuk Second Online Giovanni Workshop. This is your host, Jennifer Brennan. I've got 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, so let's go ahead. What I'd like to do first is just go over a few housekeeping items related to this workshop. First, to ensure the best audio experience, the conference has been placed in silent mode. However, if you have any questions or issues, please enter them into the Q&A pod, uh, which will be located on the lower right-hand corner of your screen. This works like a chat. The webinar will be recorded and posted online after the workshop. Speaker presentation files will be available for download at the end of each talk. The program, the program, excuse me, the program layout is as follows. Each talk is one hour long. There are 30 minutes allocated to the presentation with a 15 minutes Q&A period that follows each talk. We then finish up each talk or each hour block with a 15 minute break following the question and answer period. Questions will not be answered using the raising hand function. It has been disabled. We will take all questions using the Q&A pod at the end of the talks. I'd like to introduce our first speaker this afternoon, Cecile Rousseau, who is a research scientist at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Cecile? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yep, I'm assuming you can. Um, thank you, Jennifer, and good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Cecile Rousseau, and I would first like to give a a big shout out to Jennifer and Jim and, and the people behind the stage that helped organizing um, this, this great workshop and also for making such a great tool um, for the community to, to use um, the large data set that we produce here. So today I'm going to present uh, you the results of a paper that Watson Gregg, who also works here at Goddard and myself, recently published um, in the Journal of Geophysical Research. This data combines satellite ocean chlorophyll with in-situ data and also a model called the NASA Ocean Biogeochemical Model. All the data that I'm going to present are available uh, on Giovanni. So why look at chlorophyll? Um, well, the, the aim of the paper was to analyze the existence of trends in total chlorophyll A in the ocean. The reason why we are interested in chlorophyll is because because chlorophyll is an indicator of phytoplankton, which is the first level of the food chain in the oceans. This means that any changes in either the biomass or the composition could affect any other hydrotropic level, including commercial fisheries. The importance of phytoplankton does not stop there. Phytoplankton also absorbs carbon dioxide, thereby contributing to the sinking of anthropogenic carbon dioxide. So any increase or decrease in phytoplankton can also affect their role in the carbon dioxide cycle. So the detection of trends in chlorophyll and, of course, other variables is critical if we are to understand the extent climate change has on the oceans. This is where ocean color satellites represent a very interesting tool. Because of their global coverage, their ability to detect climate variability remains unparalleled. That said, even through the use of these satellites, the detection of the effects of climate change remains the great, a great challenge. This is mostly because, first, the detection of these effects require long time series, and satellites generally are designed with a lifespan of about five years, although so far we have been very lucky and they have transmitted about 10 years of data. Think about Sirius and MODIS, who is still flying um, since 2002. Also, two satellite missions are never designed in the same way for various reasons, including, um, of course, technology development. So this means that they won't observe the, same, the, the Earth the same way. So why, why don't they observe the Earth the same way exactly? Well, there are two main reasons for inconsistent observation. The first one is because two sensors will observe chlorophyll differently. And the second reason is that two sensors observe different chlorophyll. So in the next few slide, I will explain in greater detail the distinction between these two different points, and then I'll show you our approach to solving this problem. So let's start with why two sensors observe chlorophyll differently. If two satellites, let's say MODIS, AQUA, and SeaWIF, since those are the ones used for the data that I'll present um, later, 
If these two satellites look at the same location in the ocean, they would find different estimates of chlorophyll at that location. The reason for this is due to the difference in their senses, including the band location. So for example, MODIS used three bands for chlorophyll, whereas CWIS relies on four bands. And also some are in different spectral locations. Also, MODIS has a narrower bandwidth. MODIS has also a higher digitization and a signal to noise ratio compared to CWIS. Finally, you have MODIS that is ascending at around, you know, 130, where SeaWave has a near noon descending node. So all these differences can contribute to the reason why two sensors would observe chlorophyll differently. Now, it's important to note that these type of difference are taken into account by the different reprocessing group, including um, here at Goddard, the Ocean Carp Processing Group. So when they develop the algorithm, they take that into account and uh, they, they try to uh, account for those differences between senses. Now, the first plot that I'm showing here shows a very good example of what these differences can look like. So on the y-axis, you have the annual median chlorophyll concentration between 1998 and 2012. The orange line is the uncorrected seaweed record and the turquoise line is the uncorrected MODIS. So MODIS was launched um, on board of Aqua in May 2002. So, well, in, yeah, so it, it, its record starts in 2003. So as you can see, if you take only the series chlorophyll data and you do a linear regression to this line here, um, you would find uh, the existing of a trend that is not significant, and so there is no significant decrease or increase in chlorophyll A between 1998 and 2009. Now, the same goes for MODIS here. The linear regression on chlorophyll for the period from 2003 until 2012 is not significant. Now, if you were interested in the effect of climate change, you would want to use the entire data set so that you have enough years to look at the trend. So the obvious solution would be to use SeaWiz data from 1998 to 2002 and then switch to MODIS Aqua until 2012 or, or the present. So the black line here that you see shows the linear regression if you were to use all these data with a switch in 2002. And as you can see now, the linear regression becomes significant. And technically, this would suggest that there is a significant decline in chlorophyll concentration globally. This, in turn, could have considerable impact on hydrotrophic level and carbon dioxide fluxes, and etc. But as you can see from the plot, there is a bias between both missions, and the significant trend is mostly driven by that switch between the two missions. In fact, if you decide to switch in 2003 or 2004, 5, 6 instead of 2002, the trend still remains significant, and those are the dotted lines that you can see on this plot. So this shows that it doesn't matter when you do the switch, the linear regression remains significant. Now, what is the solution to that? Well, we have developed um, uh, an approach here um, to obtain one consistent time series, and that is called the empirical satellite radiance in situ data. And, and Watson Gregg is, is mostly the, the one that developed this approach, of course. So this approach basically relies on the same mathematical approach that used uh, for the last 36 years of ocean color data. The only difference is that instead of using in situ radians and compare them to in situ chlorophyll data like the traditional OC4 algorithm does, we instead compare the in situ chlorophyll data to satellite radians, and that is after full processing. So the chlorophyll is calculated like using this equation where R are the reflectance ratio for the di different reflectance ratio and A's are the empirical coefficient. So all the errors in reflectance get absorbed in both coefficient. And I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I know that uh, not everyone on in the workshop is, is quite um, knows about that kind of detail, but feel free to ask questions at the end of the presentation. Um, but the point is that ESRIT is able to reduce the bias of ocean chlorophyll estimate um, and improving the uncertainty and reducing the sensitivity of global annual median chlorophyll to change in radiometric recalibration. And most importantly, in the context of this presentation, it reduced the difference between different senses. 
So we developed and evaluated ESRIT using the latest version of satellite data and also in-situ data from the National Oceanographic Data Center, NODC, the NASA in-situ database, CBAS, and the Atlantic Meridional Transect. Now, for the reason of why different ocean core sensors observe different core fields, this can also be called um, sampling inconsistency, and it's due to the difference in orbits and radiometric sensitivities that lead to the observation of different locations. The sampling difference can be caused by sun glint, sensor tilt, interorbit gaps, cloud, and aerosol. Of these, reasons, of these reasons, solar zenith angle and aerosol are responsible for most of the sampling difference between seaweed and aqua. For example, these two maps show the chlorophyll concentration in August 2004 from seaweed at the top here and from MODIS on the bottom figure. You can see, for example, that the solar zenith angle has an effect on the coverage that seaweed and MODIS have. And a good example of that is the Southern Ocean. So if you look at the, what, when you see white, that means we don't have data. And as you can see, the amount of white you have in the Southern Ocean here in sea waves is quite different than you have in the MODIS data. And the reason for that is because of the difference in so the way they, they handle the solar zenith angle. Now, the masking of the aerosols between two satellites is also different because of the difference in radiance threshold. And a good example of this is the Equatorial Atlantic. As you can see here, the way the masking of the aerosols in Ceres is quite different than in MODIS. Um, I know at that global scale it might not seem obvious to everyone, but there is quite a bit less data in MODIS than there is Ceres for that particular example. And those can make actually quite big difference when you start doing um, temporal averages. Now, so what is the solution to that difference in sampling? The solution for the difference um, in, in coverage is to assimilate the satellite data into a model. The effect data assimilation has on the resulting coverage can be seen on the two figures here. So on the figure on the right, you've seen uh, what the daily coverage would be for NPP VS. So NPP is an ocean car satellite that was launched in October 2011, so it's the most recent um, satellite that was launched. Um, the black areas that you see on this map, like in the Southern Ocean here, but also the lines here, um, they are basically where no data was available for that particular day. As you can see, there is very, very little data in the Southern Ocean, and that's because this is September 1st in 2013, and so that's winter time, and um, basically the Southern Ocean is, is pretty much in total darkness, and so the satellite cannot derive any chlorophyll A from those waters at that time of the year. They are also missing data where the band swaths are, so that those are the lines that you can see here, um, and that's just where the satellite um, data don't overlap the previous swath. And then there are areas that the satellite doesn't cover because of its flight path. And finally, you have those areas where aerosols oversaturate the sensors, and therefore we can't retrieve chlorophyll data from this area. And a good example of that is the west of Africa and the north Indian, um, where there's quite a bit of uh, issue with um, aerosol oversaturation. So by assimilating those satellite data into a model, in this case, the NASA Ocean Biogeochemical Geochemical Model, which I'm going to abbreviate from now on as the NOBM, um, the, and I'm going to detail it in a, the next few slides, we are able to actually retrieve a complete daily coverage of chlorophyll data in the ocean. So this is the, what you see on the left side here. That's what happens when you assimilate the data on the right into the NOBM. So here we have combined our first solution, so ESRIT, to obtain a consistent chlorophyll data set across mission with the second solution that assimilates chlorophyll data to obtain a complete and consistent coverage of chlorophyll for the period from 1998 to 2012. Now, these two plots shows you the effect that assimilating chlorophyll data, satellite chlorophyll data, can have. Um, the top plot is the chlorophyll variation uh, in the Antarctic Ocean as seen by a satellite, by MODIS Aqua in this case. Um, 
and the bottom plot is after the assimilation of this data in the model. The advantage of assimilating these data are rather obvious for a region um, such as the Southern Ocean that can remain in total darkness for about six months of the year. As you can see on the top plot, the satellite detects no chlorophyll, for example, during June or July. Not because there is no chlorophyll, but because they cannot detect any. As you saw in the previous slide, it's total darkness there, and the satellite data cannot get data. So once we assimilate those data in the model, we can see that, in fact, there is a clear seasonal cycle in the chlorophyll concentration in this region. And although the concentration reaches a minimum during the Austral winter, they do not completely disappear during those months. These model outputs are also supported by in situ data. And you can find more information of that in um, one of our publications. Um, we tend to always have a validation uh, included. Now, for some details, and I'm going to try to keep it brief, but on the model, um, so the NLBM consists of three major components. There is a circulation model, um, and then over here called Poseidon. Then you have a radiative model called OASIM and then you have the NOBM. So the circulation model um, produces circulation field and vertical mixing process uh, that are used in the biogeochemical model to produce the horizontal and vertical distribution of the constituent. The OA, OASIM here, which stands for Ocean Atmosphere Spectral Radiative Model, is um, a model that is used to propagate light down and up through the water column. So OASIM produced the spectral representation of irradiance that is necessary for realistic estimates of photosynthesis, but also heat transfer in the ocean. And uh, finally, the model, the different components are forced by several reanalysis data, including clouds, precipitation, aerosols, winds. Um, the information that we get from this model configuration and that we make available to the public through the Giovanni website includes uh, chlorophyll concentration as well as phytoplankton composition, but also nutrients. Um, primary production is not currently available, but we, we, we are planning to make it available soon. Um, and our information on the carbon cycle. Now, if you were to dive into this NLBM boxes, you would find um, this. And that is basically, um, the representation of the inside of the NOBM. And you can see that it contains, um, I'm going to find my arrow here, the four phytoplankton groups. And then you have uh, four nutrients here. And then you have a bunch of detrital, free detrital group, as well as a full carbon cycle here with particulate inorganic carbon included. Um, so without going into the nitty gritty of the model, this model contains a reasonable level of complexity. and it has been shown to represent um, fairly accurately the spatial and temporal variability of phytoplankton composition in the ocean. Each phytoplankton group has its own growth rate, sinking rate, nutrient uptake rates, etc. The little satellites on top of this figure here um, represent the assimilation um, of ocean colored satellite data into the model. So the satellite data that have been corrected using the ESRIT approach that I described earlier to obtain a consistent data set from 98 to 2012. So um, at each time step that the model runs, we take the satellite data and we assimilate them in the model. Um, the NOBM uh, has a 1.25 to 2 third degree resolution. Um, and I think that's, that's about how much I'm going to say on the method of the, the and, and the details of the, the model. Now, um, all these data are available on Giovanni, the previous version. Uh, we are currently working, uh, and I'm talking, I was actually emailed forth and back this morning to put the data on Giovanni 4. So this shouldn't take uh, very long. Um, but for what is currently on Giovanni, um, we have the data set that are based on CWIS. And if you go on the Giovanni webpage here, um, you would go into the ocean portals and you would find the two product, which is the monthly and daily NOBM data. Um, and you would click on that. And you, as you can see, you can pick whichever one you are interested in. Um, now, once you are there, you click, for example, on the monthly. And this is what you would find. So you would have a map where you can select the area you are interested in. 
And there you can see all the different products that are currently available from the NOBM. And as you can see, those are the ones that I detailed earlier with total chlorophyll, chlorophytes, cocolitophor, cyanobacteria, diatoms, and you can see here iron, and the list keeps on going. Um, as time evolves, it is our intention to add uh, new variables to this data set as they become uh, available, and one of those products is uh, the primary production that I was talking about earlier. Now, let's move on to some results. Um, the two upper plots on these slides are the annual median chlorophyll for 2006 from Ezrit series on the left and um, from Ezrit modus on the right. So the black areas that you see here, again in the Southern Ocean, um, are the absence of data, um, most noticeable for this um, annual median is of course the Southern Ocean. The bottom plot here represents the annual median chlorophyll after assimilating the Ezrit modus through the model. As you can see, because of the assimilation, we have now a full coverage. Um, the largest difference are found in the high latitudes, such as the North Atlantic and North Pacific. So if you look at this, you can see that both Sirius and Modis have very high chlorophyll, but when you have assimilated them, the chlorophyll decreases. Um, the area of high chlorophyll concentration in the two upper plots um, that are representing the satellite, satellite data are actual artifacts of sampling only the warmer, more sunlit months. So this is a, a sampling bias. So by assimilating those data in a model, we are able to correct this and obtain an unbiased representation of um, chlorophyll. Now let's now go back to looking at the trends in chlorophyll. So on this plot, you have the annual median chlorophyll concentration um, that is represented on the y-axis for the years between 98 and 2012. And then the top orange line is the data using only series, and the turquoise line is the modis. So that's basically the same plot that I showed at the start of the presentation. As I said earlier, we had no significant trend using either individual satellite mission, but if we were to combine both missions to obtain a longer time series, we would now get a significant trend because of the bias between the two satellites. Now the blue line here, like, just here, um, is using a new ESRIT assimilated product. So there are the annual median chlorophyll after assimilating the ESRIT product in the model so, to, so as to have a consistent and complete coverage of chlorophyll. The error bars are the semi interquartile range over the month of each year, thereby representing uh, essentially the seasonal variability for each year. So we found that there was no significant trend at the global scale in the concentration of chlorophyll after assimilating or bias-corrected chlorophyll data. The ESRIT assimilated data set also shows reduced chlorophyll, reflecting both the in-situ bias correction but also the sampling bias correction. You can also note the absence of marker here in 2012. Um, the reason for this is that we apply an endpoint bias correction when doing trend analysis. Um, this is because if the first point or last point of your time series is a maximum or a minimum, it can really drive the significance of your trend and sometimes even identify something as significant when really it's just the trend becomes significant because of your last or your first point. So every time the first or last point of our time series is a minimum or a maximum, it's removed from the analysis. Okay, so we said that we're looking at the global scale. Let's now look at regional. So what we did was to divide the ocean into 12 major oceanographic regions and conduct a linear regression analysis on the annual median chlorophyll for each of these regions. What we found was that despite the absence of significant trends at the global scale, six of the 12 regions had significant trends and these trends were always negative. All the regions in the northern hemisphere that are highlighted in blue here, as well as the equatorial Indian, had a significant decline in total chlorophyll between 1998 and 2012. None of the other regions had a significant trend in chlorophyll. The trend varied from a decline of about 0.7% of chlorophyll per year in the equatorial Indian to a decline of about 1.4 in the north central Atlantic. So these results are very important since they can provide some information about potential change in trophic food web, but also an ASC exchange that could result from some change in uh, phytoplankton concentration. 
Now, this plot shows the actual time series for each of the regions that were significant on the previous slide. Um, I'm, I'm not going to get too much into details, but you can see that the North Pacific had the highest chlorophyll concentration, um, the North Central Pacific had the lowest, and they all had um, a fairly uh, obvious trend in their chlorophyll. Now, the question remains whether these trends are real or, or whether anyone else has found something like this. Um, so what we did um, was to do a, a, a pretty in-depth literature review, and we found these four other studies that published on trends of chlorophyll at a global scale. And as you can see in this table, um, each row is a different study, um, and um, they looked they all looked at trends in chlorophyll, but you can see in the second column, they all looked at different time period. They also used a different reprocessing and different resolution. And each of them had a different way of, of detecting the trends. So the point of this table is uh, just to introduce you to the extreme variability there was in the different data set that I'm about to show you and compare to each other. So, this slide shows you the map of the trends that each of these four other publications uh, we found and uh, the one that we described on the previous slide um, had all the maps except the one from Hansen, which is this one here. Um, they are all in units uh, of per percentage increase or decrease um, of chlorophyll per year. The bottom left map is in units of milligram of chlorophyll per year. Um, it doesn't really matter the units in this case since we are just looking at similarities between studies. Um, also, only the trends that were significant, uh, so the p-value was less than 0.05, are here represented. The blue colors indicate a declining trend, and the red color indicates an area of significant increase in chlorophyll. So what we found was that there was a remarkable consistency between the different studies. Several areas, such as the South Pacific and the, uh, and the Equatorial um, Atlantic, showed a consistent decline in chlorophyll. Other areas, such as the California current, had a significant increase. I think I'm, I think, well, that was the map I was supposed. So the South Pacific, as you can see, have all declining trends, um, but in the Californian current here, all the studies found a significant increase in chlorophyll. So this suggests that considering the analysis of different time periods, there appear to be a persistent change in the biology of global ocean. It also suggests that despite the different methodologies used in these different studies, we were able to detect similar patterns of moderate term change in the ocean. So this gives us confidence in our observational system, but also in the handling of data by the processing teams. Now, um, there were some areas where some of the study found significant trends, but um, others did not. Um, the region of steep decline chlorophyll um, south of Iceland, over here, um, that intensified between the 1998-2003 and the 97-2010 record. So if you can see here, it almost doesn't exist. And then now it's, it's very obvious there's declining trends. Um, Analysis of the MODIS portion of the record um, shows a reversal in trend in the portion closest to the United Kingdom. So that suggests that changes were only occurring in the most recent part of the record, which is why we don't see uh, such an obvious declining trends uh, in the record that based from 1998 to 2003. In our analysis, the entire North and Equatorial Indian basin exhibit negative trends um, over the Bay of Bengal over here. Uh, declined is persistent in the previous analysis. The Arabian Sea declined is new to the 98 to 2012 results. We note that it's vastly diminished in the 97 to 2010 um, time series analysis. So it's possible that the pre-2010 efforts exhibit artifacts due to aerosol, which are prevalent here and which complicates the trend analysis. Um, and since we correct for them, this might be the explanation of why uh, we observe different trends for that region. Now, there are other major differences. Um, some appear to be new occurrence. For example, the significant increase that have occurred in the Tasman Sea over here. Um, 
is seen in all four of the most recent observations, but that was not apparent in the 98 to 2003 records, so over here. Um, Antarctic, as you can see here, is increasing very significantly for the Siegel et al. Um, paper, but we only found, we didn't find that much significant trends, but we, we do have quite a few areas where you can see here that trends are increasing. Um, so what are the reasons that we can still dub our trends? Um, we found a significant decline in chlorophyll, um, but there always is some uncertainty in the underlying data that we used, and um, that there is very little we can do about that. Um, there is also the fact that the residual uncorrected drift in bent radiometry that we will not, we can't correct. And then we use a model, which um, you know it can be problematic um, in terms of people that believe, but we do validate it. So um, we have some pretty good data that to show that what the model the model produce is uh, actually happening. Finally, 15 years uh, might just not be long enough to detect the effect climate change has on the ocean biology. However, our approach was to analyze the data and start assessing the trends as soon as we could to keep up with any new data coming in the future. The bottom line is that we'll never completely rectify the difference in senses, but we need to develop approach that allow us to reduce the bias between those senses in order to allow us to obtain longer time series that are necessary uh, to look at the, the effect climate change has. Now, on the positive side, um, there are several reasons why we are confident in the trends that we have reported here. First, we have used the endpoint bias correction that I described earlier, uh, therefore removing any trends that are forced by maximum or minimum at the start or the end of the time series. We have also decided to calculate the trend based on the annual data instead of the monthlies. The reason behind this decision was that we wanted to avoid type 1 error, which are when you detect a trend that doesn't exist. So by reducing the amount of observation uh, and basing ourselves on the annual median instead of the monthly median, uh, we can be pretty confident in the trends um, and the significance that we identify. The fact that our approach uses a model as complementary to in-situ data and satellite data makes it very attractive. None of the methods used here are more or less important than each other. Instead, they are all supplementary to each other. Um, finally, and probably very reassuring, is that the findings in our study are remarkably consistent with previous study, and that, will, that really gives us confidence in the approach and the results that we developed here. So in conclusion, we have integrated in-situ data with satellite and model data to provide a thorough analysis of trends in chlorophyll in the ocean around the globe. By using two different satellites, this approach allows for a 15 years long time series. The approach reduced the inconsistencies between the satellite as well as the sampling bias. We found no significant trends globally, but we did find some significant decline in chlorophyll in the northern hemisphere as well as in the equatorial Indian Ocean. These local trends were consistent with previous observation. Um, and as I said at the start of this presentation, all the data used in this presentation, um, and actually even more, are available on the Giovanni website. Uh, currently, the data are based on the assimilation of series only, but in the very near future, and I expect it to be probably weeks, um, we'll post the new biological, chemical, and physical data from the NOBM after assimilation of the ESRIT series and MODIS data for the period from 1998 until 2012. So stay tuned. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Cecile. So what we'll do next is we will move to the question, and, and I do already have a couple of questions uh, for you, Cecile, okay? So the first one, if I need to just move down here, you give me a moment. Um, okay, I guess it's more of a discussion point, Cecile, okay? So okay. the first question, um, starts off with a point. I don't agree with the author's first point that different satellite sensors observe chlorophyll differently due to bandwidth and other factors. If a rigid calibration and accurate sensor spectral features are taken into account in retrieval of chlorophyll, retrieved chlorophyll concentration should be the same if the sensors observe the same location of ocean. What we can say is that the different satellite sensors may observe radiance differently 
even if they are observing the same location of ocean. Did you have anything to add to that, Cecile? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I totally agree. Um, but the, the, the point is, one of, that's why I showed one of the plot where you can see the, the obvious bias between Sirius and Modis. The fact is, if you are plotting you know, chlorophyll from Sirius and Modis currently on the same plot, there is a bias between both of them. So the difference is fair. It, there's not much, you know, um, I, I don't even know where to bring the discussion from here. I mean, it is, it is what it is. Okay. Well, thank you, Cecile. The next question is, um, unclear if these plots were created in Giovanni alone. Can the presenter say how the plots, both time series and maps, were created? And if there are any features Giovanni could add to help in this regard? Cecile? Um, yeah, no, the, that, the, the plots that I showed uh, were not generated in Giovanni. So we basically run the model um, and we generate the output and then we put them on Giovanni. Um, you can, I have basically done all the plots that you can see here in uh, MATLAB uh, because that's what I'm most comfortable with. Um, but uh, in, if you have any features of the data that you want to be plotted in specific way on Giovanni, I'm, I'm sure you can contact um, any of the Giovanni people and do some suggestion. Um, you're more than welcome to, to send me an email too if um, you want to discuss a way of or features that you can't get um, on Giovanni and, and I can help you with that. But no, all the plots in this presentation were done in uh, MATLAB, not Giovanni. Okay, thank you, Cecile. The next question is, why does the Bay of Bengal show a negative trend? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Um, I don't know, and, and we are actually currently working on another paper which is going to look at um, the physical and the chemical um, variables and the, the, the trends that exist in those variables. And um, so we haven't actually made the connection uh, between the existence of the trends that I reported here and the drivers of those trends, but we are working on that. Okay, thank you, Cecile. Uh, the next question is, it is clear that spatial availability of data is different for two sensors. I wonder, could we get the number of data pixels involved when retrieving space plots, Hovmuller diagrams, time series, or else? Um, yeah, well, I guess that's more of a question for um, the people that put um, the raw claw fill on Giovanni. For us, we have complete coverage every time step because we do assimilate the data, the satellite data into the model. So we have 100% coverage. Now, if you if you were to download, uh, I think the Ocean Color Group here is, is either working or has already put their data as well on Giovanni. Um, in that case, um, yeah, that would be a good suggestion, I think, would be to have a an, an option where you can plot the number of pixels that are masked. Um, yeah, I think it's a good idea. Okay, so I think um, James Acker is actually answering or adding uh, to the question that was asked. Okay, so here we do. We do have um, a response. Are there any further questions? Uh, here we go. Okay, do the spatial patterns of decreasing chlorophyll concentrations in the North Pacific overlap with the decreasing O2 observed at Station P in the North Pacific? Um, another question that I don't know. <laughs> um, I haven't looked at that, but it's a, it's a really interesting point, and um, it would definitely be worth investigating. But no, I haven't, I haven't looked at that. Um, we, we mostly look at uh, nutrients and, and mixed layer depth and the stability of the water column, um, which is somewhat, you know, it's obviously related to um, the type of O2 concentration you would have. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a very interesting point. OK, thank you, Cecile. I see that Jim is answering another um, question. Are there any further questions? I don't see any yet. Ah, OK, I'm none. Did the model take into consideration CDOM? Um, yes. Um, we do have, so in the OASIM, 
model that I showed you earlier. Um, I don't know if I can get back to the slides, uh, Jennifer. Can I? Yes, you may. Hold on just a moment. Pulling them up now. Okay. Um, okay. I'm going to try to get back to, um, to the slide 12 that I need. So, um, okay, so you can see that we do take um, CDOM into consideration in the optics, uh, so that's the OASIM part of the model. Um, so we have a, a specific absorption um, for CDOM included in it. Um, there is definitely place for improvement of how we represent CDOM in the model, um, but in terms of the effect that CDOM has on, you know, the the light propagating in the water column, we do take that into consideration. Okay, thank you, Cecile. So the next question is, what's the algorithm of debiasing used? The debiasing algorithm, what, which one is used? A debiasing algorithm. Um, I'm not exactly sure I get the question, but um, if it relates to how we remove the bias between the two missions, um, that was on on slide. I can't remember. Um, it, it's basically the point is that it's the same way as the normal ocean color algorithm I developed, except that the normal ocean color algorithm I developed based on in situ radiance and in situ chlorophyll. The way ESRIT works is that we compare satellite radiance with in situ chlorophyll. And that's how we remove the bias between the two satellite missions. Okay. Does that help to answer your, your question, uh, Krishna? Okay, let's move on while he's answering. Uh, how reliable is, how excuse me. How reliable is the nutrient data, especially in inshore waters? Um Okay, well, that brings another point. Uh, we don't we don't do inshore waters. Um, the NOBM is only for water that are deeper than 200 meters, which is why we had in the title here uh, open ocean. Um, we don't. The reason why we don't do at least currently uh, inshore waters is because um, the way satellite data handle chlorophyll in those waters is very different from in the open ocean, and so we decided to focus on open sh ocean. Um, water, so anything deeper than 200 meters to develop a model. Now, we are working on another model uh, called GEOS-5, um, and we are integrating NOBM into that new model. And uh, with that, once that will be ready, we will be able to achieve um, to a depth of 20 meters. So we'll be a lot more inshore than we were before. Um, but we are in the testing period, and we haven't looked at how well the nutrient data matched the uh, in situ record. Okay, thank you, Cecile. So there's actually a follow-on to the um, debiasing question, and the follow-up is with respect to whether or not it is linear debiasing or any non-linear debiasing. Um, I, I, I would. It, it's non-linear debiasing because you uh, you go back to the raw data. And you just look. At, um, yeah, you don't. You, yeah, it's. I think the answer to your question it's nonlinear debiasing. Okay, thank you, Cecile. Are there any further questions? We've got about a minute left for questions, and then we will take a short 15-minute break. Any questions, anybody? Let's see. Also, if um, if anyone, you know, thinks about a question later on, feel free to um, email me or if I haven't um, re replied, answered your question, um, please don't hesitate to contact me and um, I, I can try to, to do better. <laughs> okay. Is your contact information listed on your, within your slides, uh, title uh, slide? Pr probably not. Um, can you somehow give, give Yes, I can. What is your email is Cecile. Dot s.russo at nasa.gov. Okay, everybody. I'm typing in our speaker's contact information, Cecile 
dot s as in Sam dot Rousseau at nasa.gov, correct? Yep, that's correct. Okay. And then just another point before we take a short break here. Cecile's file, uh, her presentation is down below if you can see in the lower right hand corner of your screen participants. Um, if you want to download her presentation, you would simply highlight that file uh, with your cursor. It will then give you an option to download the file. Oh, I've got another question here. Oh, okay. <laughs> I answered it. Okay. Can you put again the past? Can you past presentations? Um, so is it Myra or Mira? I'm not sure I understand the question. Did you was there a specific presentation you wanted me to pull up, or did you want Cecile's presentation pulled up? If you could clarify, that would be most helpful. Uh, okay, sure, I can pull that back up. Did you have a specific question? For Cecile, before we move to the break, I've pulled it back up, Cecile. Oh, okay. Let's go ahead and take a 15 minute break. Okay, and so if everybody could be back, I've got your Giovanni 4 URL here, as well as information about the Friday poster session. And just as a reminder, Friday, you will not be joining us in this virtual meeting space. So on Friday, you will go to, uh, and Jim, if you have anything to add, uh, please do so. On Friday, you will go to the URL uh, to review the PDFs, which will be posted there. Um, and I understand that, Jim, how are you going to 